welcome back our second presentation for the day is on tending to the violin we have a number of violinists in carnatic music but do they take care of their instrument that is the question and uh, our today the presenters on stage are mr james wimmer who after training in uh, under master violin makers in germany set up himself as a professional violin maker in 1980 in his studio in santa barbara in california and has since then been tending to violins new and old and along presenting along with him is a person who rarely needs any introduction to us in particular lalgudi shri jjr krishnan who comes from a family that can trace its lineage in the violin for several generations it's over to you now for 45 minutes and then we will have question answers with the audience thank you very much and i request those of you with cell phones to please put them on silent and children are most welcome but children have to remain silent during the course of the presentation i'm sure parents understand the necessity for that thank you very much namaskarams to the learned rasikas vidwans and vidushis members of the expert committee the executive committee of academy and at the outset on behalf of mr james wimmer and myself i want to congratulate the sangeeta kala nidhi designate shrimati saumya and it's such an honor to be presenting this lecture and i thank the president the mr sri ram and uh, the executive committee for this wonderful opportunity i'll just jump into the subject without much ado the modern violin made its entry into carnatic music hardly 200 years back and we know that four persons have been accredited for the introduction they are varaha payar bala swami dikshitar krishna swami bakutar and vadivelu and for vadivelu we have the name of his western guru frederick schwartz is the name so they have first learned the western way of playing the violin and then indianized this wonderful instrument which has become sarva vyapi or omnipresent or a ubiquitous instrument in the not only in the carnatic music arena in the whole of indian music but unfortunately for the upkeep and maintenance of this wonderful instrument we have not been very fortunate to have access to the repair facilities to the tools to the knowledge the technical know how it's a very highly specialized art the art of maintaining this instrument so instrumentalists the violinists had to wait for a foreign trip to happen so that they take the violin which is gone a bit out of order and there have been instances when in 1965 my guru carried the violin of shri vidwan sangeeta kalanidhi papa venkatramaya sir to edinburgh to take it to hill and sons and get his violin mended so the situation is not any better i should say probably i am a bit harsh but it is a nightmare for a violinist when his violinist gives up or develops some problem this has been the situation now we have with us the master ludio from santa barbara mr james wimmer who will be sharing his knowledge with us why mr james wimmer here you may ask when there is google and youtube but youtube you can never judge the authenticity or the correctness um, there is a master ludia with experience since 1980 over 40 years <laughs> so he is here to help us and uh, please don't judge me by my questions i'll be posing some very innocent and ignorant questions so that i get the answers for all our benefit 
violin is considered as an emperor of instruments. The flexibility of the instrument with reference to tuning first enable this instrument to enter Carnatic music. We have totally changed the tuning. The other advantage from the violinist viewpoint of view is it can be tuned to any pitch. I want Mr. James Wimmer to explain whether this is an ideal situation for the violin. Has it been designed this way or does it affect the tone? That's my first question to him. Oh, okay. Well, first the violin, uh, when the fi violin first arrived on the scene around uh, 1500, uh, back then it was actually tuned considerably lower at uh, A415 hertz and as time went by and uh, the needs of orchestral players increased we uh, the, the uh, A has been increased to 440 so almost one entire um, one entire note so the violin is quite versatile uh, it, in India you typically tend to uh, tune the violin quite low um, and when I took my first uh, Carnotic violin lessons, I thought, oh, this is going to be fun. Fiddling, my teacher called it. He took my violin and tuned it down to D, and I, I felt like I had no strings on the violin. So <laughs> it was quite a bit of difficulty to adjust. But uh, in terms of pitch, uh, India is not the only culture to retune the violin. It's quite common in fiddling. In the USA, we use a, um, a tuning sometimes called DDAD, or DDAD, we call it, which uh, is even lower, actually, than your D, because we tune the G down to D as well. Um, in Ireland, it's quite common for fiddlers to tune a little lower. Now, I'm because I work with the classical violinists, I'm used to my violin always being up to Western classical pitch exactly. So my own personal feeling is when the violin is a little low, it, it, to me, it doesn't sound right. But this is only subjective. Mm. To, the, to any violin player, you can tune the violin really any way you want. The only problem is if you start tuning it too high above uh, A, E, A, E, you'll start to encounter difficulties breaking strings and, and in encountering actually weakness of tone. Yeah. Next is, is we have varying climates within India with varying humidity. It does affect the instrument. How do we take care of it? Well, the violin by and large, in particular new violins versus old violins, is quite a durable instrument. Uh, it's made to take some punishment. I have personally carried my violin in a case on top of the baggage piece over a high Himalayan pass at 5,100 meters uh, under freezing conditions like Antarctica. And the violin didn't suffer any problem at all. The main danger for violins and bows as well will be if you travel to uh, conditions of very low humidity. Um, the, the plates of the violin, in particular the top, uh, take on water from the air and they also release water from the plates. So if you go to, say, Rajasthan, where uh, the, in the desert the humidity might be quite low, around maybe even 10%, so the, the violin top can shrink. And if it's not glued with hide glue, which we use to release uh, the tension, uh, we'll explain that later, the rigidity of the ribs, the, in other words, the sides of the instrument, hold the instrument so rigid that if glued solidly, say with uh, synthetic glues, the instrument tries to shrink and it needs to release tension so it can easily crack quite dramatically at, at times. Uh, so high humidity, on the other hand, uh, you've all seen it, I'm sure, can cause problems in particular at the bottom of the violin. I can yeah, you take this. I got it. I got it. So 
if you're looking at your violin, in particular in conditions over 80% humidity, if it stays like that, say during monsoon season for a week or two, keep an eye on your violin here. The pull of the strings on this button can cause the instrument to open and pull out. You need to immediately release the tension. Then it can be easily repaired by a qualified violin-wise technician. <laughs> Or also, it's quite possible that the neck might come out. Or the fingerboard can easily come off. We make the violin in such a way that it is easily uh, able to be dismantled. So this is not a plot to get you into the violin shop for costly repair. Typically, these kind of repairs are not expensive. And, and your best bet is really to release the tension of the strings go immediately for violin repair and and if it's properly glued with our hide glue you call it animal glue uh, the repair is really quite simple and generally not too costly yeah now we have the fantastic aid to assess the humidity we have the hygrometer so what steps can we take to correct the situation when the humidity is low and what is the ideal humidity level well, when the humidity is low, in the West, we use what they call a damp it. Uh, it's basically a rubber tube with a sponge inside and holes that you can uh, put into the lower berry of the F-hole. And will, it's quite long. Will it long. affect the tone if you put it, insert it? No. Um, the only t effect on the tone will be that uh, the humidity can always change uh, the tone. If you travel from dry area to humid area, any professional musician who's traveling will notice changes in tone. Uh, I notice this even just traveling in Germany a lot. Uh, and it's nothing to worry about, by the way. In, in any professional musician knows don't worry about it. So uh, just live with it. This is the violin. And about the orange peel? Oh, orange peel. Some musicians put orange peel or pieces of apple in the case to humidify, you could actually just take a sponge and put it in a plastic bag with a few holes inside if you travel to dry area. This will help protect your instrument. And if you have it outside the case for only a short while. But uh, th this is really, for in most cases, only necessary if the humidity starts dropping below 25%. Um, otherwise, if it becomes too humid, say in your monsoon, uh, my friend who is a violin maker in Taiwan for many years has kept a list, a mailing list by email, and he sends out humidity warnings to his clients uh, to, and reminds them to please take their instruments into air-conditioned uh, rooms because air conditioning uh, creates dryness that's nearly perfect for the violin. That is a fantastic uh, practice, code of practice, which violin repairman can probably follow here also. Yes, I think it, th that would be very uh, important to establish this particular practice with your violin repair person. We've been very fortunate this time to have AC in our workshop because we need uh, good conditions in particular for varnishing. It's uh, almost impossible in humid conditions. And uh, thanks to the air conditioning in our workshop, we've been able to varnish easily and it's been most enlightening, actually. I also learned quite a bit by working here in India. Yeah, when the temperature goes down, we have the practice of, especially when we travel to the US, we have the practice of putting the violin close to the fireplace. How advisable is it? Uh, <laughs> the, the heat and uh, the proximity to the fireplace can create quite dry conditions, in particular, I know from the northeast of the United States, everybody heats with wood-burning stoves. So it can become quite dry in the entire house. And uh, my own violin, uh, within hours of arriving, cracked two times. Uh, so it's very important to keep an eye on it. Everybody should have a hygrometer. Yeah. And uh, coming to the next question, Many of the violin students perhaps may not know the existence of a sound post inside the violin. That's a revelation for many of the 
violin students. We have an interesting name for that in Italy. We have a parallel in the Indians. I would like you to explain that. Yes, the, the sound post is a quite simple little piece of dowel rod, six millimeters thick, made of spruce. Uh, I know sometimes it's the practice to go to the local hardwood uh, store and just purchase any piece of hardwood. This is definitely not appropriate. It can damage the violin and it won't produce tone. The sound post in Italian is called anima. And anima translated into uh, Sanskrit would be Atman. It is the soul of the violin. Yeah. One of the Ashta Siddhis is Anima Siddhi. We have it in Dikshatya's composition also. It, it's also quite the point of aggravation because everybody knows that you can move the, the soul of the violin and um, sometimes they move the soul into very bad places which is not advisable. And some have the practice of gluing the sound post. Hari bop, hari bop. And uh, next question is, we are used to playing in uh, auditoriums which do not have AC. And uh, while we practice, there is a lot of sweat which emanates from our fingers and also from this portion. How does it hamper the instrument, the fingerboard? Uh, well, uh, sweat is a um, personal matter. Some people sweat a lot and it can be quite acidic and uh, it actually causes them to go right through the varnish to the wood very quickly. So if, if you have this particular problem, it's very important to make sure that the neck in particular of the instrument is maintained um, a regular visit to um, one of our violin wise personnel. They've been trained on uh, how to apply a special, um, very tough varnish there. And uh, also, you can uh, experience the disappearance of varnish up, uh, on the body where the hand touches the body. Uh, otherwise, the, one of the main problems I see here is that uh, oftentimes the, the oil and sweat, this will not affect the fingerboard in the least. Oil versus talcum powder? Talcum powder, talcum powder is quickly becoming a practice of the past, quite simply because if you inhale the powder, it's much like inhaling asbestos or any other mineral dust, which will not break down in the lung. And with time, these deposits can cause cancers. So uh, I would not recommend it. Uh, oil will not really seriously affect the string. However, I've met violinists who oil the entire hand and the oil goes everywhere. And the problem becomes then with a poorly attached violin fingerboard. Oftentimes I see here where um, the repair person has quite simply purchased a fingerboard, which we call a blank, it's not finished at all. And then, because the, uh, the glue surface is not perfect, they quite simply attach it with super glue or epoxy or some other inappropriate resin glue. Uh, uh, and this allows a gap to occur between the neck and the fingerboard. And oils can get into this gap. And we've all seen the, the neck, which is blackened by old, old use, and uh, I've actually seen necks which were saturated like a sponge with oil. And the problem there is that no glue, not epoxy, not the most fantastic gorilla glue, super glue, hide glue, none of it will bond to an oily surface. So when you've glue tried, made all the attempts to put epoxy and all these things in under the fingerboard and the fingerboard comes off, then it becomes a very difficult and costly, uh, time-consuming experience to remove that glue uh, down to wood because our, our hide glue will not bond to any other glue. It, it will bond to hide glue surfaces. So we need to clean perfectly. And the hide glue 
can easily be cleaned in about five or ten minutes using water only. And hide glue is the ideal glue for the violin, you said? It's, in the West, it's the only glue for violin. I, any other glue being used is considered a crime against the instrument, quite so simply because the, the synthetic glues are stronger than the wood. So when we start to dismantle the violin and we encounter synthetic glues, nails, screws, anything like this, that leads to further damage of the instrument, which is not the point of the exercise. So when we go to US or Europe, it is advisable to get a small quantity of high glue. Yes. Um, the problem, I would say, in India is keeping the high glue fresh. Because of the humidity, the high gr glue is what I would call hydrophilic. In other words, it's a friend of water. It loves to take water from the air. And then uh, in w once it takes too much water, then it begins, you know, maybe you know that it starts to smell bad. It can smell very bad. And uh, at that point, it starts losing its power. So if you bring hide glue from the west to here, it's best to keep it in a dry condition somewhere, air conditioning, perhaps refrigeration like this, or, or I don't know about freezing it, maybe not advisable. And about strings, we cannot be using the same string for different pitches, and we cannot be using the same instrument for different pitches also. How does it affect what, about the gauge also you want, I want you to? Oh yeah, well, uh, typically in my own experience, I, f I find that uh, musicians are quite opinionated about what strings they use. In India, I see predominantly the use of steel strings, uh, which is r really a very practical decision because of the low tuning you use. Steel strings are easily tuned to different pitches. You can take the violin from Western classical pitch down to D easily with a steel string. It'll take uh, very little time really to adjust. I personally use what we call a purlon string. It's like a nylon string. It's been designed to replace the old-fashioned gut strings, which uh, are another subject altogether. They're quite difficult, expensive. Are cat guts used? <laughs> cat gut? Uh, no. Uh, the old uh, gut strings were made of sheep stomach. And I think the term cat gut must have originated because of the uh, horrible screeching sound of the beginning violinist. <laughs> and how do we take care of the adamant tuning pegs? Sometimes they uh, refuse to budge. Yes, uh, this is a problem of humidity. When, when it's high humidity, the holes, the, the, the maple of the peg box will swell. And so the holes literally become smaller, right? And they tighten onto the peg. And um, it's best not to feel desperate. Uh, the best thing to do, again, is go to a, a technician. The, if it occurs, the, the absolute best thing to do is play your violin daily, use the pegs daily, and then this problem shouldn't occur. It's only when you don't use the pegs for a long time and it tightens up, then you can have this difficulty. If you use some pliers, I think you call it spanner, to um, to try to loosen, you can easily damage or even break the peg, which yeah. becomes a, a bigger problem. And how about the fine tuners? In uh, Western, they don't have this. Uh, yeah, yeah, you, you can, you can see, see I, I don't uh, use them. Uh, I use the friction pegs, like a Western classical player insists on a very well lubricated, very well fit friction peg. Uh, the only th problem with fine tuners is the individual tuners, the, the steel ones, have several moving m mechanical parts which can come loose and cause extra musical noise. Also underneath, uh, you know it has the little arm which comes down and if, if the musician is not paying attention, this little arm can touch the top and also cause a buzzing or rattling. Or if insistent enough, the musician can actually dig it into the top of the violin and cause damage there. So w once in a while, you need to loosen the tuner 
and tune up with the peg, and then yeah. then you have plenty of room uh, for play with the um, with the fine tuner. And how about bridge care? Bridge care. Well, a bridge, if properly maintained, can last for many, many, many years. Um, the bridge should be properly cut. Believe it or not, we do not fit a bridge by putting a piece of sandpaper on the top of the violin and then vigorously rubbing until it appears to fit. This makes for a round surface, which can cause the bridge to rock back and forth while tuning. It can also, uh, with a higher pitch tuning, cause damage to the violin. We very carefully cut with a knife or a chisel the bridge to fit perfectly to the top of the instrument. We do this with no strings and so that the bridge stands there without us even touching it. We look and then we cut, then we put it, we don't touch it, we look again and we cut. This way we get a, a perfect fit of the bridge and every violinist should know how to, pardon me one second, Perhaps you can, I've just put my bridge out of adjustment, uh, out of sight of you. But you can see the bridge is now leaning very far forward. You see that? Everybody can see that? When this is the case, the bridge can bend in the center, right? And uh, once it has this bend, we call it the death bend. It needs replacing because it will only cause problems and it can cause problems with tuning because the bridge will flex constantly as you try to tune. And in a worst case scenario, it can fall. This one is in very grave danger of falling. So in particular with low tuning, let me demonstrate here. Uh, I'll just stand up if I may. You can take the bridge. Can you hear me? You, yeah, you can hear me. It's okay. Yeah. Leave it. You take the bridge between your first, uh, your thumb, and your second finger. Take hold of the bridge here. And uh, you place one finger to the side of the E string, one finger between the E string and the A string. And you do similarly on the other side. You see? Hold like this. And then using a motion, a slight rocking motion, and holding the violin solid, brace against the edges, you can literally pull the string back into position. You see? And now it's straight again. And, uh, oops, if the bridge has been, uh, if the bridge has been properly cut, you can inspect to see if there is any open place under the bridge foot. If there's still what we call air underneath the bridge foot, means you need to pull it a little bit more. So this, you don't need to uh, change the string tension. Now coming to the bow, the bow and rosin as, it, as you call it, we call it here rosin. <laughs> so we In have America, dust. In America that would be rosin. Yeah. The dust of rosin settling on the body, how do we take care of it? If you're concerned about such issues, the best thing to do is just clean it after uh, every use. You can take a soft cloth, much like this, and just rub it off. It's quite dry, so at that time it will come. If left on the violin and subjected to uh, heat and humidity, it can become soft, and, and rosin is possibly the most horribly sticky substance on the planet Earth, so it will stick to the surface of the violin and become difficult. But not to worry, because you can again go to your violin wise technician <laughs> and uh, they can professionally clean your instrument and uh, what is the care a performer has to take before the concert and after the concert of the instrument and the bow well I would say just check your instrument if you go to a Western classical concert you'll see the orchestra comes on stage they start tuning the violinist might uh, You'll even see them look at their bridge, right? Inspect the instrument, make sure everything is okay. Um, mostly, I would say, before and after the concert, don't worry. <laughs> 
and uh, regarding the extensions because the sitting posture makes them bend forward and making them very comfortable now i mean un uncomfortable so we are adding on some extensions right how does it affect the tone um i'm i hear various things about this can you take this please and yeah, maybe sure. put it now the extension of course is an attempt for the player to sit more upright and avoid the ubiquitous back pain and um you want me to put that? No, no, it's okay. And so the uh, the problem becomes how to avoid because the uh, I'm I'm uh, one meter ninety five tall. When I was taking Carnotic violins uh, in lessons, my experience was pain in my body for the most part. And so I've given a lot of thought to this. And as a violin maker, we want to solve this problem aesthetically the extensions that I see being made in, in India are incredibly inventive. I mean, they're a tribute to the inventive nature of people to solve the problem. Some of them have screws and, and other holding you know, metallic devices, which by their nature come loose and during the concert can cause some rattling and noise. So our solution is to make the sympathetic string violin extend the scroll the extender is built in this one was built uh, by one of our students over at the workshop in the last six weeks yeah, I'll speak about the yeah. Uh, sorry I mean we have been taking some steps and about which I'll be just before he demonstrates any further I'll just want to run you through the highlights of violin wise lalguri trust has been blessed to undertake this job of bringing in james mr james wimmer the master luthier from santa barbara since 2013 and this is the fifth edition this is happening 2013 we had three week workshop then 2015 we undertook two week and then 2016 17 and after which in 2019 this is the final edition we have uh, one and a half months of intensive training where not only violin repair skills it's not just for violin we have had ma maestros from uh, ch cellist also visiting the uh, workshop and benefiting out of it and this time Perhaps this is the first ever time in the history of Indian music four international copies of international quality copies of Stradivarius have been made in Chennai, in Pinagar. Thanks to Mr. James Wimmer. It is very essential for this art of violin repair to continue further. So the uh, Mr. James Wimmer was kind enough to donate a lot of tools. There are highly specialized tools which, which are used to repair the instrument. Till now, we never had access, we never even had the knowledge of about the existence of such tools. But we made it a point to bring, get all the tools and uh, have it so we prepared a workbench. Each of the four is being donated with a workbench and all the tools worth uh, perhaps a thousand dollars each more. for each or more. more. Yes, and Lalguri Trust took care of the balance and we made workbenches for this and as you can see th those are specialized knives and uh, you can see the workmen Yes. So we have at the end of this four quality top notch violin repairers, not only violin repairers, for this entire stringed instrument fraternity, we have service people. They have learnt it the German way in the perfect condition. It is these violins are international quality violins and it can be bought by a New York Philharmonic violinist. 
So it is such an achievement, a historic thing, which <laughs> thanks to Mr. James Wimmer, we have been able to do it. And uh, the main idea of getting the tools is we have the technical know-how. These four top-notch interns who are becoming graduates or journeymen, as Mr. James Wimmer calls them, they can carry on the workshop and the tools can be replicated with the engineering technical know-how that is available here. So it is going to give us a long-term benefit for posterity which each one of us can avail. Gone are the days when each professional will secretly, sec secretly hold the name of the violin repairer. It won't be disclosed to the next professional for obvious reasons. But now you can get hold of any of the repairmen who will be available after the workshop. They are present here. And uh, if I may, uh, we'll be outside after the workshop, after this uh, talk. And uh, if you'd like a closer look at the violins and the quality of the work, uh, please, uh, we can introduce you to the gentlemen who've been learning and they'll, I'm sure they'll be happy to show you their work absolutely. outside. And uh, several maestros have visited this workshop and benefited out of it. And <coughs> a violin maker, a violin repairman has to be a violin maker in the Western situation. That is a must prerequisite. And it is yes. better if the violin maker is a violinist himself. That is a very essential prerequisite because how can you judge the tone of an instrument? How can you adjust the bridge? And you have to depend on the musician. You have to wait for him. It's not possible. But uh, now I, <laughs> I will ask. Uh, I'll request Mr. James Wimmer to show his, if I may, talent as the violin vi fiddler. It's uh, one of the. Uh, yes, I'm not a violinist. I'm a fiddler. Uh, we we make that distinction. Thank you. Uh, we're very proud of the way we play, and. Um, it's my understanding, from what people tell me, that the teacher of Balu Swami was a fiddler. Now you say his name was Frederick Schwartz? That is for Vadivelu. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So the name of uh, Mr. Balu Swami's teacher remains unknown. So if I may, I would like to make a small tribute to this teacher of the great master. He'll bring you a mic. May I? Um, yeah, he'll get the mic. I, I can stand yeah. out here with your permission. Yeah, before he uh, gets ready. The authentic wood, maple, spruce, which were bought in perhaps the 60s, were very kindly brought by Mr. James Wimmer. And I happened to go to the US, and I left one suitcase of mine there mm -hmm. to carry the tools for the workshop. And this violin voice has been a very highly satisfying and gratifying workshop. And the violins here the entire stringed instruments in India, if they access these repairmen, will have a better tone and we can all listen to better creativity and it's a great thing which I feel I'm blessed to have contributed. Yeah. Just imagine, if you will, this is a one piece back for violin, one piece back for the violin. Imagine how much work goes into carving and shaping it. So, yeah, thank you. This particular violin I made for myself in 1999. It's been serving well with uh, no problems for a long time. I took my favorite wood. So as a tribute to Mr. Baluswamy's teacher, I would like to play a fiddle tune from the Southern Appalachian Mountains of the uh, eastern coast of the United States called Valley Forge. Thank you. 
It was a long time dream of Mr. James Swimmer to play at the Music Academy of <laughs> in Chennai. <laughs> yes, I, I believe it's a historic first to also have fiddling here, so it's a great honor, believe me. And just as an aside, I'll just, this slide is Shardamba, uh, the term fiddle and violin, just a piece of information. All stringed instruments were known as fiddle because this was commissioned by one of the administrative officers in East India Company. This was painted and uh, the, the note is not readable here, but it says Shardamba playing the fiddle. <laughs> so thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. James Wimmer. Thank you, uh, GJR Krishnan, for a very enlightening uh, session. and. Uh, you know, I think Music Academy can take pride in the fact that Mr. James Wimmer is the is one more performer from abroad. From the very first lecture demonstration in the Music Academy in 1929, we have had international participants. In 1929, we had Mrs. Constance Stan Harding, who was arrested in Russia for being a spy and then came all the way here to oh. perform. <laughs> and from there, we've come a long way. We've got somebody from the United States now. I hope I don't suffer the same fate. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, before I pass on the mic to the members of the Experts Committee, just a couple of points on the uh, provenance of the gurus of our, you know, the first violinists. It is very unlikely that Christian Frederick Schwartz could have been the guru of Vadivelu because Schwartz died in 1798 while Vadivelu was born only in 1810. But so I picked it up from the dessert. It is completely incorrect because uh, the I tomb of uh, Schwartz is something that I have seen myself in St. Peter's Church in Tanjavur and the date is very clearly because Sharaboji uh, writes a poem uh, when Schwartz dies and that is inscribed on the marble in the church and the date is very clearly. I given. took it from the dissertation thesis, I'll talk to it's, you. Uh, I, I, I can see that <laughs> whoever it is has not had correct information. The <laughs> other thing is that <laughs> Baluswami Dikshitar appears to have learned from a brown Doravariki who was with the East India Company. Uh, again, people say that this is C.P. Brown, but that again is very unlikely because C.P. Brown came 30 years later. So, we really have no idea who this Brown Doravariki was who taught Baluswami Dikshitar. As you say, he is an unknown man who has had a worthy tribute today from you on stage. Thank you so very much for that. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, members of the Experts Committee, can we begin with Sangeeta Kalanidhi Shri TV Gopalakrishnan today? I am very happy that the violin, as we when think all the time the Western instrument, not we don't know anything about it, we don't know how to repair and all that. That situation has changed thanks to Krishnan, J.J.R. Krishnan, one of the most, can I say, perfect one is in the parampara of Lalgudi Gopalaya, Lalgudi Jayaramana. On his, today, he stand, stands out on his own and we perceive the love for the instrument. Then and the Language Trust is so broad-minded that people will have the benefit of all the work he has done. It is very important to maintain the instrument. And this workshop, thanks to the Music Academy, Morning Sri Ram, has happened to open the eyes of many young violinists, that violin should not be treated like a piece of any electronic equipment. Violin is much more precious for its sound and uh, I am very personally happy for this very beautiful presentation. Thank you. Sir. Thank you, son. Thank you, Dr. Wimmer, please. Today we have a husband and wife duo. The wife sings and also plays the violin. The husband plays the violin and also sings. So we have MSN Murthy and Dr. Pantula Rama. So between the two of you, you can ask two questions, you can ask one question jointly, I leave it to you. Please <laughs> <laughs> take a call. I let the violinist speak first. Yeah. The uh, women always have the last word, Murthy. 
నమస్కారం ఐ అప్రిషియేట్ ద గ్రేట్ ఎఫర్ట్స్ మేడ్ బై ద లాల్గుడి ట్రస్ట్ అండ్ పర్టికులర్లీ శ్రీ జీజే ఆర్ కృష్ణన్ అండ్ ఐ హ్యావ్ ఎ క్వశ్చన్ టు మిస్టర్ జేమ్స్ విమ్మ వాట్ ఈస్ ద ఎఫెక్ట్ ఆఫ్ ద స్ట్రింగ్ ఆఫ్టర్ లెంత్ ఆన్ ద ఎఫెక్ట్ ఆఫ్ ద సౌండ్ సౌండ్ ఆఫ్ ద వయలిన్ ఈజ్ ఇట్ సిగ్నిఫికెంట్ స్ట్రింగ్ ఆఫ్టర్ లెంత్ స్ట్రింగ్ ఆఫ్టర్ లెంత్ ద ద లెంత్ బిట్వీన్ ద బ్రిడ్జ్ అండ్ ద టైల్ పీస్ యా Yes. Uh, this is a bit of a controversial subject. Um, there are those who uh, will advocate that it, it can give a sympathetic effect. However, if I pluck the string, almost nothing will come. I, th- I think the tension there is quite high, so the effect will be less. There are those who make special tail pieces to lengthen this. Uh, and s- I find it still to be a controversial subject. we have uh, the tail gut here in particular the modern tail gut can stretch so after we uh, do all the adjustments it can easily change so this will also change any effect that might be felt here so i i, I really uh, i'm i'm not a big believer in this i believe that sympathetic resonant effect comes from the other open strings okay. thank you or sympathetic strings if built onto the violin thank you most welcome Dr. Pantula Rama. Um, I would uh, really thank uh, Mr. Krishnan and the Lalgudi Trust for taking up this uh, magnanimous job, I would say. Not only violinists, we vocalists should be very grateful for this work because this uh, significantly improves the tone of the violin. For, uh, of which we have been uh, constant sufferers all these years <laughs> so <laughs> having a good tone of violin by our side makes the job so much more easier and usually mr murthy accompanies you yes yes so <laughs> that makes my job a lot easier because he is very well versed with the i maybe i'm talking about the others so <laughs> not demeaning any of the artists but the general ignorance of the uh, aesthetics of tone in the, in this country and um, i would like to thank mr james wimmer for uh, throwing light on all of this but and i would i have a question regarding the extensions because i am a sufferer of this myself uh, because of my height i would like to have an extension for my violin and uh, does that length of the uh, extended uh, scroll uh, does it affect the tone in any way um i wouldn't say so as long as it's tight and does not have any mechanical rattling or uh, other extra musical noise it should not really affect the tone um and even if it does the player will generally just get used to that kind of tone huh. it, it won't seriously affect i don't believe uh, the only kind of extender that i really object to is this practice of drilling a hole through the uh oh, no, scroll yeah. and putting a cello peg or something like that because it it weakens the scroll and if struck it can break it yes um yes. and also it's it's an offense to the original maker to drill a hole we would never drill a hole through um a beloved statue sure. or a painting uh, like this and the, the scroll is literally the uh, signature of the violin maker sure. themselves yeah because we have been using those uh, separate extensions which we Uh, you know cup into the scroll and tighten the screws and uh, that uh, significantly uh, um, uh, dampens the tone of the violin whether it's made of fiber or wood or some other wood uh-huh. so when you have a natural scroll extension like this a length of the scroll is increased i think that uh, works uh, way far better than these uh, added extensions yeah i think so i mean uh, you could even extend the scroll like this without any further pegs if you didn't care for the sound of the sympathetic string yes, yes. but it would have to be special made Thank and you. um the, the best thing if you're going to use an extension is to pad between the extension typically made of wood or fiber or something like that I would pad between there with a um uh, a piece of thick cloth or preferably leather if you don't mind. How does cork work for that as a padding? It it, it works as a protection surface for the violin itself because by if you screw a piece of wood or something you can mar the uh, scroll and cause some damage. Yeah, I wanted to know how does the material of a cork uh, work there? The the cork that you use on the bottles uh as cork cork and an extender would work very well much like the we have cork here on the bottom yes, of the yes, uh, 
of the chin rest in order to protect the violin. That wouldn't dampen the sound in any way, right? Um, by and large, I, I don't think the scroll itself contributes or detracts from the, uh, the actual sound unless it's just quite simply too heavy and, and weighs down the violin. Okay. okay. Right? Thank you. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you. I would be failing if I did not recognize the presence of Lalgudi Vijay Lakshmi in the audience, the oh. other member of the Lalgudi Trust. Thank you. I now pass on the mic to Sangeeta Kalanidhi designate Dr. Saumya for her comments. Namaskaram. Thank you very much, Sri uh, Jijar Krishnana and Sri James Vimar, for this absolutely delightful uh, and useful uh, presentation this morning. <laughs> Even though I, I haven't, you know, dared to <laughs> play the violin but I've always enjoyed the tone and the way it's being played, the way it's been adapted into our Indian music. It's so beautiful. More because probably a veena or a harp or a yard wouldn't have given this kind of continuity. So that is probably why violin was chosen so much uh, for Carnatic music and it's been a very, very, it's been a student's and a musician's delight this morning to listen to you and uh, hear this kind of uh, uh, work on uh, the violin. In fact, really, as uh, Ramaji rightly said, it's been very magnanimous of you, Krishna, not to, you know, bring this and enjoy the whole thing, not just by yourself, but make it available in India here, in Chennai, that too. <laughs> and to bring a specialist, a person, a veteran in this field, I would say, who's been in this field for 40 years, to bring bring him here, uh, make make him interact, I know you also have, you've been having workshops otherwise, which is really commendable because it's not just a presentation, they've been available. They've, they've made themselves accessible despite, I think, Krishna's busy, busy schedule also uh, to all the younger generation or all the violinists, all the vidwans yeah. here in Chennai. I, I just really. want to add one. Usually the violin maker, Luthier, will not be available in the shop. A lady who doesn't know anything about the instrument will be accessible to the customers. So he's hardly yeah. seen. So we are, it's really pr precious his presence. Yeah, we, I'm so happy we to look see out only from him behind. here. Who, who is that? <laughs> we look. And uh, by the way, I'm certain after uh, hearing me play, you need have no fear to begin your violin lessons today. <laughs> <laughs> it was absolutely enthralling. It was so nice. <laughs> I mean, it was very different. It was not the usual straight notes. It was some very lilting melodies. It was very enthralling, really. Thank you for that additional bonus this morning. And uh, I just had one uh, uh, question. Sure. Uh, it, it's very nice that you have brought in maple and you know spruce wood. But have you thought of any Indian wood, or how would it be? How could that be adapted, if possible? That's very difficult. Uh, the oh. the um, violin is a, a very conservative instrument, mm -hmm. and it has a very long history, at least 500 years. And it, it has just quite simply been well established that uh, European maple and spruce is um, really the only accepted wood for the instrument. So I'm afraid, I'm sorry to say, these woods do not really occur in India. Um, our, our makers here who have already been making successfully some violins have been importing. They've, they've found some sources where the wood is less costly, but it is, it's quite expensive wood. So of course it would uh, affect the cost of the final instrument. The closest you have to the uh, spruce of the top would be your uh, deodar from the Himalayas. But this uh, is too heavily resinous and, and probably would not give the tone. The this, this spruce is harvested when uh, the, the tree is in its most dormant phase, so there's less resin, so it becomes very quite lightweight, uh, I'm sorry to say. <laughs> <laughs> but the, he has brought a piece of wood. If you tap on it, it's very musical. Perhaps. Yeah. Maybe we can hear. Is it spruce? Yeah. Oh. This is a piece of spruce that was cut in Germany in the year 1966. Wow. And maybe you can hear the, the resonance. Oh, wow. See, it can ring. 
unseasoned wood? Oh no, this has been sitting waiting to become a violin since wow. 1966. Even without, you know, the yeah. string or even without. Yeah, that. there is a lot of correlation. I was very fortunate to purchase a, a, a rather large collection of this wood. Um, and so when coming here, I, I wanted uh, the violin wise technicians to have the best possible start. So all of these violins have been made with old wood. The, the tops are all from 1966 and the, the backs and ribs are all wood that I personally purchased in Germany in 1990. Wow. Wow. And uh, just, uh, I don't know if it sounds uh, dumb, but it, uh, what is your take on fiberglass or some other, because we do have, we have we, there are people who work on such uh, material for the, you know, Mridangam, for example. So I was wondering if something has been tried for the violin, alternate materials? Oh, of course. Yeah. Engineers are always at their work. <laughs> <laughs> their, uh, engineers are always trying to improve the violin and uh, carbon fiber has become one of the, the most uh, prominent. Mm -hmm. uh, it has a great deal of promise in bows yes. because the Pernambuco wood, uh, it's a Brazilian tropical hardwood, has become endangered and is now, in fact, uh, starting to appear on the uh, CITES list, we call it, the, uh, the, uh, the Council regarding international trade in endangered species. And so uh, we're, we're the bow makers are quite concerned about the future of this wood for their trade. So a great deal of progress has been made in carbon fiber. In the, co in the instrument itself, um, I don't find it so satisfactory. The tone is strange. And the instrument, the surface tends to be quite slippery. It's very difficult to keep a bridge in place. Oh, okay. The main advantage is you can take it and play it in the shower while you're bathing. <laughs> <laughs> I don't recommend that with your regular violin. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I think 1966 seems to be a very musical year, is what Sri Ram says. So you know why he feels that way. I, I'm also from 1966. Yeah. Oh, oh <laughs> wonderful. This is from I your like birthday. To meet my brother in <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, it was really, really very nice. Uh, I, lovely analysis, and I really like this way of presentation. Krishnan asking question, and it was a different presentation. Very interestingly done, so thank you very much. Thank you. If Tomorrow I may, it's been a great honor to be here today. I would like in, in particular also to thank Mr. Krishnan and the Lal Goody Trust for making this all possible. Uh, it's been uh, 30 years in the waiting to be here. And uh, I would also like to thank everybody from the Music Academy to make this possible. And uh, I hope it's the first time in history that uh, a fiddler has stood on this stage. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>